All right, um, we're back. It's <clears throat> more Comp 305 uh, in the fall 2017 semester uh, at Centennial. And we are week four, part one of our broadcast, and we're still doing the mail pilot build. We're going to go into more details today. Uh, but before we get into that, I want to talk, there it is. I wanted to talk more about that final project and give you a little bit of a timing update for this stuff, right? So, so we did, um, there's a couple of things that we've already kind of uh, taken care of, but if you notice from a schedule perspective, next week, uh, week five, we're looking at our game design document version two. So that's what's due next week. So it'll be, it'll be worth 5% of your final grade. And if you look at the details on the document, which is kind of cool, you can see that, um, so you need to update the GDD. Right now, this is all the stuff that um, you would modify based on uh, the fact that you've done a little bit of work. Maybe you've thought a little bit more about your game now because you've had a couple of weeks to think about it, work with your team and all that kind of stuff. Um, maybe you're making changes like, hey, what about the arced fire? How's that working? You know, kind of thing for people who are doing the tank game. Uh, or maybe you're going to do parallax scrolling for your, um, your, si your side scrolling kind of shooter or scrolling shooter game. You know, so those kind of things you can add in. And uh, the good thing to do with that is to try and write in your changes as much as possible. The GDD should be as detailed as you can make it in terms of mechanics, story, dynamics, uh, aesthetics, the whole thing. You should try and put as much detail in there as possible and make the document your own. So the next version I'm looking for is make sure if you haven't done it with color last time, like, you know, you haven't, maybe you haven't chosen your, the colors for your team. Don't just leave it as black and white. Maybe... You know, there's a different color scheme you want to use for, for your documentation to make you stand out compared to other teams. Um, so that's the kind of stuff you want to think about. It's just another revision, another kind of uh, draft. Make sure there's no spelling errors or any of that kind of stuff. Uh, ensure that you include your GitHub link again uh, for this one because you're going to need to uh, kind of uh, a link to your project. I'm looking for that this week coming up, so that's next week. And um, if you haven't started your Unity project, you got to get going on it because uh, week seven is your first playable. So that means like we're sitting at work week four today and we got three weeks to put together a first playable that includes movement, some kind of mechanic for your, uh, you know, for your game, uh, just to give you an update, right? Uh, collision detection um, has to be in there, has to work, all that kind of stuff. And so when you think about it, if you don't start now, if you haven't started with your game, you're kind of behind, right, uh, at this point. So please take a look at that. Um, you only have um, a few weeks to get to, you know, to kind of uh, to get to week seven. We're starting a week four. And week seven is taking the place of your midterm in terms of you're going to present. So this part here, first playable build, um, you're going to present this thing. And remember, there's a couple of things you need here. One is... Uh, your WebGL build, right? A link to your WebGL build online, so live. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. How do I set up, um, you know, GitHub pages? Because we need to get there. Another version of your of your GDD, right? Because you're going to, again, continue to work. Part of the stuff that we need to add into your GDD for version three is screenshots, right? Some screenshots of your game and how it's progressing. So an updated project, um, you know, you're also going to actually do an updated project uh, pr or proposal. You're going to say, hey, here's my my project in this next state. Now, it's going to be an update. So I'm not looking for a complete pitch anymore, right? Uh, the next version is literally you going up there and saying, a couple slides here. Here's who we are. Here's my project. Here's kind of a demo of where we're at, right, for, my, for, for your pl first playable. And that's what's due um, coming up um, on week seven. So next week... It may seem like a little bit of a, um, you know, not much to do, like, you know, an update of, of your GDD, but actually you can put in quite a bit of things in here to get yourself ready for week seven and start working on your, your actual prototype in Unity. Okay, let's take a look um, as we move forward with, um, with Unity, right? So we're left, we left off. We have a couple things. I'm just going on, I'm just continuing with the Unity prototype that we had, right? We have our ocean, we have our player, we have our island, we have a scrolling background, right? That's part of it. And when I play now, I can see that my plane, again, this is in the, uh, uh, my plane kind of moves around, right? 
there we are. And scrolling nicely, nice and slowly because, you know, I'm kind of broadcasting and it's in the simulator, which is okay. But that's really what it's like. It's kind of moving along. And as I, as I approach the, the island, the idea with the mechanic of this game is I'm going to score when I get on the island. Okay, cool. So I want to add the enemies now. And the enemies are going to be these massive thunder clouds. Right? So if, you, if the plane flies over or under the, the thunder clouds, it takes damage. Right? In fact, you lose a life. Okay, that's how it works. So let's do that. Let's go into my, into my uh, uh, sprites. And you can see that I have an ocean, uh, an ocean sprite, the island sprite, and the plane sprite I've already used. And now I want to put in the cloud sprite. Okay, so I'm going to drag and drop the cloud sprite like before. And I'll rename it so it says cloud. But we're going to have some issues with this one now. And, and this is where it gets interesting this week. Because so far we just have some objects. We just drag and drop them, put a little bit of script to make the move, and that's it, right? Like I said, I'm going to try and finish off the prototype. There's a lot of work to do today. It looks like it's easy. Lots of stuff to do. So cloud, what do we do with the cloud? Um, well, let's take a look at this thing. So if I press F for frame select, and when my mouse is hovering over here, I can't see the cloud because by default, the order and layer is zero. I got to think about this now. The plane should go underneath the cloud. And if my, look at my plane, Order and layer is two, which means my cloud order and layer should be three, so or something higher. So let's put three, so you can see that that appears, right? Okay, so that's really cool. So my here's my cloud. I'm just going to drag this thing. So I'm going to press again, again the top keys. You can access these top keys with Q W E R T, right? Like the quirt part of your keyboard. So I really want to move it. So that would be the W. So I'm clicking W, so I get the two handles for X and, uh, and Y. X is the red handle again, and Y is the green handle. I'm going to move the cloud up here, and it's going to be very similar to what I've done with the, ocean, with, the, with the island. Now, here's the difference. I want to make my cloud come down. Okay, so this is the user story for the cloud. My cloud should be random, okay? It's not going to be just coming down straight at me. I'm going to have varying speeds. It's going to be going between let's say a speed of five pixels per frame and 10 pixels per frame. And it's also going to have a bit of some kind of lateral movement or a horizontal movement to the right or the left. So it's going to kind of, you know, go to the right or, you know, kind of drift. It's going to have a horizontal drift from the right or the left. So that way it can come either way. And I'm not going to just have one cloud. I want to have three. Okay. So this is a new thing. This is multiple, um, you know, objects based on a single prefab. How do I generate them? Lots of stuff to do here. So this is what we're going to be doing for the first part of our video. Lots of stuff. Okay, so if you see this, so I've got my cloud. I got to do the same thing as I did with my island. Notice my island. I just started at a starting position. Um, I want to start with the scripts part first because it's going to be very similar to the island in the ocean. And again, when I say similar, so similar that we might want to even create a class, right? But for now, let's just leave it alone. Right, so we're gonna get optimization stuff done later. So I double click my island controller, and you can see that when my mono behavior starts, mono, mono develop. <laughs> if my mono develop starts, <laughs> how about that? Right. If you ever have this problem, by the way, um, there's a couple po possibilities. I've uh, unfortunately, and I mean, I mean it in the in the best possible way. I've unfortunately had the, the um, um, bad luck of having my machine crash over the last uh, couple of days, and I've rebuilt it, right? Um, it happens. Very rare on Mac, by the way, but it happens. So what's maybe what I have to do eventually is reinstall uh, MonoDevelop. So <coughs> this is a great opportunity for me to use another editor. So if I look at some preferences, let's take a look here. Look at the preferences. Look, you can see that there's under external tools, there's different options. One of them is mono develop, right? One of them is mono develop. And the other one for you guys would be Visual Studio. There's Visual Studio, right? So you can see that I can also use Visual Studio for my, uh, my editor, right? Because I have both. There's Visual Studio for Mac as well now. It's nowhere near the same as Visual Studio for Windows, by the way. But it does exist. And it says, add Unity projects to the solution. Sure, we'll do that. Doesn't matter. 
Now let's see if it works because remember I haven't tried this out. There's also, I can also choose another editor. If I want to use Visual Studio Code, I'm going to show you how to do that. I'm running into an issue. I need to, I need to, co I need to code somehow. So I got to do this. There's no choice, right? So let me save this. So if I go back down here, you can see that I should be able to save this thing. I'm going to save my scene and I'm going to save my project, right? To try and fix this up. And I want to double click on my Island controller now, and hopefully it'll bring up a version of Visual Studio that it will work. Hopefully. And by the way, like I said, I had all kinds of lovely issues. This bouncing around thing makes me angry, right? Once I see this bouncing around stuff happening and I'm like, whoa, okay. I don't know if it's going to work. I don't know if it's going to, how it's going to function, but all I care is about that. I have an editor. This is cool. It's, it's, it's so far so good. I have an editor that works. Okay. And, um, I don't care about this right now that I can let's see if I can make this a little bigger for you guys to see. Yay. Uh, that I can use, right? So kind of similar to Visual Studio on the, on Windows machines, but it's on the Mac, okay? Okay, so let's take a look. So what we did last time was we had a couple of private fields. One of them was reset position, right? The reset position, what is that? One, and I, I serialize the field. Serializing fields is an attribute. I can make an attribute. Uh, it's like a filter, if you think about it, that you put it be before. This works in any C Sharp program, by the way. And C Sharp, depending on the library that you're using, provides these attributes, and it does special effects for uh, for your code. So sometimes what we want to do is we want to database. If you're if you're a developer, a software engineer, and you and you're doing ASP.NET, uh, and you're using ASP.NET MVC as a good example. So if you did uh, what's that course? Comp two 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 nine. Comp two two nine for you guys, which is um, um, kind of like an enterprise computing course, right? With uh, Visual Studio and ASP.NET, then you will have to connect somehow. There's two parts. One of them is uh, web forms, where you make websites with uh, ASP.NET and, and C Sharp. And the other part, sometimes, depending on who's, who's teaching it, when I teach it, I teach it with MVC, Model View Controller. When you do that, you have these attributes that are like filters. That kind of describe the model, which is data, how the how um, how you connect to your database, let's say at a very high level. And it's interesting because you can kind of say what the fields are. Similar and similarly in Unity, you can use these square brackets to indicate that you have special effects happening on on this particular uh, variable. This private variable becomes something we can see in the inspector, and that's what this does. Okay, so we need this. In fact, a large amount of this code is going to be duplicated. In fact. New vertical position. I need this part. Again, think about what I'm doing. I'm oh well. Yeah. Uh, no, we're not going to do that right now. Um, but you can see that there's a large number, a large part of this behavior is stuff that we can can duplicate. In fact, most of it we can duplicate. So if I take all this stuff, right, just the way it is inside here for now, and again, duplication, I would say, is bad. It's not a good thing to duplicate. That means I have code that I'm rewriting over and over again. And I don't want to rewrite my code. I want to have, um, you know, I want to do as, as the least amount of dupl code duplication as possible, even in Unity. All right. So I've copied that. I want to make a new script for my cloud. So here's my cloud. I want to make a new script. So I'm going to add the script here first and then attach it afterwards. That's how I, how I like to do it. You can do it different ways. So I'm going to go create C Sharp script. Okay, I'm going to call this cloud controller. Yay. All right, so here's my cloud controller. It opens up nicely in Visual Studio. And what I want to do here is just wipe all this stuff out and copy in the stuff from my island. So just Control-V or Command-V on the Mac. All right, so there we go. So we got everything in there. I've got some, everything from my island controller is in there right now. So nothing is different. Okay, this is good. And this is kind of indicate, in, indicative of I need a super class. I need something that controls my island, controls my ocean, and controls my clouds in a very similar way, right? Because they all come down at me somehow, right? They're all moving. They have, they have a reset position. We have a check border function. All those things are the same. And if it's the same over and over again, like I said, it just code duplication. We want to reduce that. We want to write once and use uh, a bunch of times, right? So that's this part. All right, but once I've set this up, I'm not done. 
I have to look at my, I've got to attach it to my cloud, right? So that's part one is writing the, the script. The other part is actually physically attaching the script uh, to my cloud. So you want to hover over until you see some kind of either a plus, again, depending on your version of Unity, or if you see that it actually goes somewhere, like you can see that it's going to go, there's a component that I'm adding in between one place or the other. There's a little blue line that appears now. And then I can see that my script got added. Now, reset position for my cloud is not the same as my island. My island's position was 270 is my reset position, right? Now, that would not be the same as my cloud. So let me take a look at that. So if I click on my cloud, I can see that the position I put it at right now is 326. Okay, and this is why the scripting is works really well because what I want to do is I want to kind of zoom in here and see. And I'm going to get really specific here because I want to find exactly where it's going to be. So you can see that on the top of my cloud, I would say that covers the the bottom part of my cloud there. You can see that, right? And it's approximately 328. So let's just put 328. Now, just to test this out, I want to put negative 328 and see if it covers the lot via the top part of my cloud. Typically, Unity has this kind of symmetry, right? So if I go F select, frame select, and I go right to the top, you can see that the cloud now is underneath my screen, right? So that's good. So 328 and minus 328 is what I want to do. So that is my reset position, 328. Remember, I used one number now. I don't need two numbers because it's the same thing. It's just a minus, right? Uh, or the opposite in, uh, in, from a symmetrical perspective. Vertical speed. Okay, this is what has to change. Can't be the same vertical speed. For now, let's put a you know a stat vertical speed of ten, so faster than the ocean, and faster than the the island. So let's, for now, let's put ten in there. Yay! And my horizontal border. Now this is again something that's a little different for the clouds. If I go F for the top, I can see that. And if I'm going to I'm going to kind of zoom in here, you can so you can see it uh, a little bit better. Um, actually, I'll do the Q here for this one. If you look in, I can see that, and this is part of my uh, messed up little uh, thing. So it looks like negative two, 206 on this side. It might not be the right, right number. 206 on the other side to see what it looks like. And I'm going to go F for frame select. And actually look at the actual object. And you can see that I have a little bit more room. Right? So let's try 207. That's pretty, that's pretty accurate. You can see the pixels, like they're pixel perfect. So you see like the rough edge around the pixels, right? And I did this on purpose. So you can actually uh, build a per pixel per perfect game. But now see this rough edge on the pixels. You won't be able to see that in the game itself. It'll be kind of anti-aliased. Um, anyway, so you can see that that's the, that's the case. So 207 is the right number. So I'm going to put the horizontal border there as 207. All right, that should be enough. I should be able to run my cloud if I did everything correctly and there should be no issues. So let's try this out. So uh, play, and now I should have my cloud coming down at random places, right? And but straight down. Now this makes the cloud quite boring. It does move faster, my uh, island, which is cool. And there's only one, only ever one cloud. And if you actually look what's happening in the scene, just to zoom out a little bit, so you can see how this whole uh, thing works. I just wanted to show you just so in miniature, so you can see the whole thing working. So there's my ocean, and you can see how it's uh, <clears throat> resetting. Okay, so I'm gonna see if I can pull that in there for you so you can see the whole thing, the whole process. So it resets, you can see the cloud resetting over and over again, you can see the island resetting over and over again, but it looks to the user like there's multiple islands, right? And there's multiple clouds. Now you can make some island variations, you can add in a different sprite for the island, so it's not like looking at like the exact same island, um, you can make a different sprite for the clouds. You can modify this, the, the um, I would say, the scale of the clouds if you want to, right? And we're going to try and do some of that to make it more interesting. But you can see that the, there's only one cloud, and it doesn't make it for a very challenging game at this point. Um, it's only going at 10. And one cloud doesn't make it challenging enough because if it hits my player, the idea is that my player is going to die, right? Well, my player can easily avoid the clouds right now. No problem. Okay, so we but we got it working. Okay, so we need to make some modifications to the to the uh, cloud controller first. So if you look here, um, I have a horizontal border which is good, but my vertical speed, my vertical speed, is okay, right? 
but I'm going to use it as the top vertical speed. Okay, so I'm going to say that it's going to go between five and ten. So maybe as slow as the um, um, as the island, as slow as, but as fast as ten. Now I'm going to have more than one, so this is going to make it quite challenging. Believe it or not, it's going to make it almost impossible to play without getting killed. Uh, but let's it's going to, so it's going to be challenging enough. So that's going to happen on my reset. So on my reset, what I want to happen is my vertical speed is going to change. Okay, so that's the one thing that I want to do. So my reset is this thing that's happening. I want to take these debug uh, out as well because this is just my debug, uh, the debugging uh, code that I have to, to figure out where my, my, my uh, stuff is. Same thing with the island. I already have a debug in there too. So I'm going to take out that debug out of my island, save that. Okay, so both those, those things uh, are gone, right? Because I don't need more debugging information, right? You can see all the scripts here on the top of my Visual Studio, um, <clears throat> which is pretty cool. So what I want to do here is on reset for the cloud. So one thing is I changed my horizontal position. This is cool. I changed my transform position, right? So based on my horizontal position what I, that I calculated on the horizontal border, that's the same as the island. But now I also want to change my random um, speed. So I'm going to say that this got vertical speed, right? If you look, hover over it, it's a floating point number, right? That I've, that I've kind of defined, right? And I'm going to say that it equals to a random dot range, just like we did before, right? With the min and max, right? So my min speed is going to be the minimum speed one I'm going to use. And the maximum speed is going to be my vertical speed, right? So this is what I really want to happen. I want to have my vertical speed be um, a min and max value as opposed to uh, something that is going to be uh, fixed. So I got to change this up a little bit. So the idea that vertical speed is, is here is good, right? That's what this is going to be. But I don't want to serialize this field anymore. So I'm going to take this out. I don't have to serialize every field. I only, I, have to, I only have to serialize the fields that I want to see. But I want almost like a minimum and maximum speed, right? So, and I want a variation. So speed variation or whatever you want to call it, right? And I want to kind of define the speed variation as one number again, like five, right? But I'm going to add it to this minimum speed. So the minimum speed is going to be five, and the maximum speed is going to be the minimum speed, speed plus five. So double, this, double the, the minimum speed kind of thing, right? So I could kind of def define this as min max. I could do that, right? Or I could define one number. For our purposes, let's make a min max speed, okay? Serialize fields. And if I press uh, uh, control space, if I'm, or sorry, command space, no, what is it? It needs to be a lot easier. It actually popped up, but my version of Visual Studio may not uh, support that uh, function. And if I say private, um, I'm going to make it so that it is a floating point number. So I'll say uh, min vertical speed, right? And by the way, there's other ways to do this. And I also want to say max vertical speed, right? Well, here's something. I'm using vertical speed twice, right? So imagine if, just putting it out there, I want to use, I want to have another class or some kind of struct, right? Um, that really is, has two things, a min vertical speed and a max vertical speed. So I'm creating a new object, right? That has both a min and max value. Can I do that? Think about what I'm asking here. So although my public class cloud controller here is a part of mono behavior, I could include other, other classes here as well. For example, if I say public class and I call it um, vertical speed or something like that, let's say vertical speed. It'll be inside my vertical speed class, right? And by the way, I need to serialize my class, right? So if I take, if I want to serialize, I want to be able to kind of use this class, right? I want to serialize this class. So again, I think I have to hover over, right? And then if I control space, yeah, I'm not getting any code hinting. You guys should get code hinting. If I you start typing serialize, you'll start you'll start seeing that there's more of this. But if I want to look it up. 
So I want to look up what that is because I can't remember. So if I say serialize class unity, right? That's what I really want to do. So serializable. Okay, so notice that if I say system serializable and I and use a class like this, what it'll do is it'll make it to uh, uh, to my code. That's what it does. Okay, so system serializable. So that's what I have to start doing. Let's go in, in there and try that again. So system system. Oh, why is it giving me that problem now? Hot. Serializable. Yay. Okay, system serializable. So now when I put that in, it's another modifier or attribute or filter. You can call it different things. And what I want to put in here are two floating point values. Instead of this min max vertical speed, right? That's what vertical speed is all about. I have two. I have my a floating point number, right? That's uh, min vertical speed. Or min, I'm in minimum, and uh, a floating point number that's a maximum, right? <clears throat> I want to make these public, right? So I've created this little object here. That's what it is an object class that I'm going to use. And instead of using minimum and maximum in here, right, I want to make it of type vertical speed. So my vertical speed here, like this, I can call it vertical speed now as a class. I'm using this vertical speed class. And I'll just call it speed, right? Now, when I do this, just to show you this, this thing. So I've got this little class. It's an object. It has two, two, pro of two properties, a min and max. And by the way, they're not properties. They're fields right now. We'll make them into properties in a second and show you the difference. If I go back, um, if I go back to Unity, right, let's see what I see now with the cloud, right? So uh, before I had vertical speed, if I go back to the island and back to the cloud, sometimes what happens is I get this other value in here. And sometimes what we need to do is I believe we have to build. Let's just build. Okay, we have errors. Let's see what the errors are. Okay, so let's see what the error is. So if we get a float, oh, there we go. Of course, we're gonna, we have this. We didn't fix this, right? Vertical speed is random range, right? So we have two. We have vertical speed up here, which is rent, which is a, a, a value. And vertical speed is going to be this, you know, speed value, depending on what we get in here, min or max, right? That we're going to generate. Of course, we didn't finish this off, right? So my vertical speed is going to be my min and max values so if i do this and let's say i want to see that um i want to get the min value so i'll say speed right dot min right you can see how that works and then speed dot max and if i really want to be explicit i can put the this keyword in there because it is a lot this is a value that belongs to the class right i don't have to uh, unity doesn't force me to but i can now we should, now remember, whenever there's an error, this is the thing that happens. If, if there's an error, it won't allow you to see uh, the objects in the, the inspector. So if I go back to the inspector now, um, and if I go back, if I go back and forth from island to cloud, I should be able to see this little insert here. Take a look, right? On the right now, I have this uh, sub menu, right? Because I have a class and I have min and max. It's almost like a little sub menu. So this property, what I've defined here is of type there's minimum and maximum values, which is neat. So I have a reset position and my speed is min or max. And I can say that my speed starts off at five and goes to a speed of 10. You see that? So how did I do that? Well, let me go back and, re and, re and, re and review. So one, I created this little class, right? Called vertical speed, right? But it really, what it really does for me is it captures this idea of a minimum and maximum value with one class, right? And so it's all it is is a little a little object class. And instead of a class, here's another question. Could I not use something called a struct, right? Because Unity also supports structs. So notice, notice that this struct, I just changed the class from a class to a struct. What's the difference? I know 
for you C sharp people out there, if you know, you guys, some of you are software engineers. What's the difference between a struct and a class in C sharp? There's a difference. Yes, yes, but what else? Right? Um, uh huh. Kind of in C sharp, but one the one of the differences also is that structs and classes are reference types. Okay, that's the difference. Now in C plus plus, that's not true. Structs in C plus plus and classes are almost identical. The only difference between structs and class uh, and classes in C plus plus is one is private and the other one is public. Right. Um, so that's not the case here. So here, if I use a struct, will it work? Will it work the same way? So if I save this and go back and I cut, click away kind of thing and click back, I can see that a struct works just as well. And it might work better for us than a class. It's a little lighter, in fact, than a class is, right? Because I don't really need to put a constructor in there. There's nothing that I, that I need to put in there, set up a, a constructor. It's a little lighter for me. It's a value type, not a reference type, right? Um, and so I can use it as I like. OK, let's see if this works. So it should vary now between 5 and 10. So there's little micro steps that we're doing, right? All right, so let's see. So it's going like that right now. It should be sometimes very slow, right? And somehow very fast. That was, see, that was five. You can, you can see because it was the same speed as the cloud. That's really fast. That's a little slower, right? A little faster, really fast, a little slower. Oh, same speed as the cloud. You can see that because it came down at the same time, right? So I have variation now in terms of speed for my for my for my objects. My cloud will come faster or slower, which gives me that chance to, of survivability. Otherwise, once I have three clouds in here, it'll be almost impossible. Okay, next, 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 next. I've got my cloud and it speeds up and slows down. Right, not really that exciting, but it has some variability in terms of speed because I got this little system serializable class up here, right? Um, from an organizational perspective, by the way, as well, take a look at this, right? I got reset position, I got vertical speed, that's kind of private, I got my speed and horizontal border. So you may, the way you set this up up here, and this, these are all your, uh, we'll call them uh, the uh, fields. These are all the fields in the class. The fields that appear in the inspector, you can also declare them is the way they appear. Sometimes what you wanna do is organize them so that they appear in, in some kind of, you know, uh, order of some of some sort. Okay, so that's one one thing we have to do. Now we have to talk about horizontal drift. Okay, and I want this variation of horizontal drift. So I've got vertical speed. Now I want horizontal speed, right? And my horizontal speed is going to go from let's say a minus two, so it's going to go to the left, to a positive two. Don't make it too crazy because if you make it like a really crazy speed, like it's gonna it's gonna be messed up. Okay. But now, oh man, look, I called this struct vertical speed, right? But it's really not a vertical speed. It's just a min and max value. Is there a better name that I could call this struct so I can use it for my horizontal speed too? Because it's going to have minimum and maximums, just like my vertical speed does, right? So let's go first, let's define my serializable field. So serializable, serialized field, right? And I want to make it private and I have horizontal speed. Okay. By the way, even if I put these as, as lowercase, like this, vertical speed. This is the sorry, this is the the the, the type vertical speed I have put it. But I could put this, this is speed, and maybe what I really want to put here is horizontal speed. This is private, and I can make this sorry, this is vertical speed. I'll be okay. I have to, I have to change it up and again. Let me add, let me undo those changes. Hold on. First. First, first, first. What I want to do is rename speed, which is my serializable, uh, serializable field, something else. But this vertical speed's got to change too. So vertical speed, I'm going to rename. So refactor, rename. And I'm going to change this vertical speed to an underscore, right? Just to indicate that it's truly private and it's, and it's not, not something that I'm going to be sharing on my, my uh, inspector, OK? Then in my vertical speed, instead of calling it speed, right, I need to call it vertical speed. And I can do that. Even though the class is called vertical speed, I can call it that. But however, this 
is not vertical speed anymore, right? It's like speed min and max, but it's but it's minimum minimum maximum. That's what it is. Minimum maximum, almost like a my own custom range, right? So I have a range, right, of of uh, vertical speed and uh, and or whatever. Maybe it's going to be a range of something else in the future. A minimum and maximum values. I want to reuse this thing over and over again. Right now, it's sitting here in my cloud controller, but maybe I want to make another another little class on its own, right, somewhere else that I can use it throughout my code, right? Some minimum maximum values, right? So if I do that, can I call it range? Is that available, right? And you can see that range seems to be okay but if i use range then this vertical speed's got to change to range so it's a type of range and then this speed i can rename to vertical speed and that's what this is this range is vertical speed i gotta mess with my code in a second actually let's just undo that change i'm gonna rename this here refactor rename to hopefully it won't rename this one to uh vertical speed right there we go and uh, my horizontal speed, right? That's what I want to call this one. It's going to be of type range. It's another range, which is going to be horizontal speed. Horizontal. So I've got two speeds: horizontal speed and vertical speed. Well, let's see if it messed up my my uh, my code because it looks like I might have, I still might have an error somewhere. So here's one. So it says this speed min. It didn't do the 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 re uh, the refactoring. I don't want speed min, it's vertical speed min and vertical speed max for my vertical speed, if that makes sense, right? So vertical speed min, vertical speed max. That's all I'm doing so far. Let me just hide this so you don't have to see it. Okay, so vertical speed min and max, I did this. All I've done is, is, is I've re rename some of this stuff so that it works best. So here's vertical speed. Here's my vertical speed. And I have a horizontal speed that I also get. And you know what? I have this variable vertical speed, which is just my data. And this is the stuff that I'm getting minimum and maximum values from the inspector. So I want to put this up here as well. Now, just to really show it, all right, I want to try and take, I want to reorganize my, my code here. So I'm going to take this vertical speed and put it up here reorganize the stuff that's private and the stuff that is going to be exposed in the inspector and just reorganizing for you guys to see. And then here's my private. I'm going to make this truly private horizontal. I'll be okay. Rare. So I got this holds the data. This actually does things, but this gets the data right from the, from the, uh, uh, from the inspector. Okay. Different variables. This is kind of like my property, not really because it's private, but I'm, I'm serializing it. And this is where I'm holding my data. They have the same, the similar name. I'm just using an underscore to, to differentiate them for now. Okay, so what do I do here? What do I want to do? Why am I putting this in there and all that stuff? So I need two changes. One, I need to update, on update, right? It's going to move my, my X position, right? It's going to change my X position to this new horizontal position every frame. I need to do this, right? And on reset, I want to change my vertical speed to some random range that looks like this. So let's just take this line here first. This is the easiest change. And I'm going to put this underneath. And I'm going to change this from vertical speed to horizontal speed. Okay, so it's going to give me a random range be between, instead of vertical speed men, I want to change it to horizontal speed min. Why? Because I'm going to have two values in the inspector, right? One that's vertical speed minimum max and one that's horizontal speed minimum max, right? Does that make sense? So I can move, I, I have that, I'm almost creating these little ranges on the inspector to give myself variation. And I can play with the numbers if it doesn't seem right. Like if it's too slow or too fast on the inspector, it gives me that like little dial that, the, that your, uh, um, the programmer can use to modify stuff programmer being me right now, but what if I took and I gave you this code and I said, go ahead, use my code. Here's my new, my new classes I made, my little 2D video game. And if I want you to make other kind of video games, I want you to reuse my code somehow. Um, you can do that too. Okay, so that's one. Two, I need to change my update function. Here's my update function. 
where instead of me having my new vertical position, I also want to have my new horizontal position. And notice that my new vertical position goes here, right? And my new horizontal position goes here, right? So, okay. I've done this in a couple of steps here, if you notice, right? Where I could have put all this stuff right here, uh, my new transform. I could have written this a little, a little differently, right? There's different ways of writing the same code, right? So this is one way of doing it, where I break out new vertical speed, new vertical position, and new horizontal position, and then I have my new my my transform position. My transform is actually just to recall what that is. The transform of every object, game object. If I go back to Unity, every object has a game object. Uh, every game object has this transform, right? And it has uh, rotation and scale and position. So position, rotation, and scale. Right? Every object has this, right? So my transform dot position is pointing to the component, the, the transform component in my uh, on my object, right? That's what it is. Okay, that's what the transform position is. So what I want to try and do here with my transform position is instead of me doing this twice, I want to do this in one line. I want to have my x and my new vertical position be in, me kind of together, right? And my new vertical position is going to be equal to my old position y, right? Minus this, the vertical speed, right? And then I want to add my range of horizontal speeds. And I want to take my x position and add or subtract whatever, the, whatever I have to do here from my, my horizontal speed. So it goes either to the left, drifts to the left, or drifts to the right. So I want to add this. Okay, that's what I want to do. But it's only going to change on reset. So whatever I, I whatever random number I get, let's say I get a minus two for my horizontal, right? It means I'm going to go to the left. I'm going to drift to the left every frame, right? So I want to continue subtract minus two on the x position every frame. So it's going to drift to the left all the time, right? That's what I want it to do. So I could write the same thing. I could say float horizontal position is equal to transform dot position dot x, and then instead of that minus, I'll say plus this dot underscore horizontal speed. And that would be done. And then I would put in here, new horizontal position. I could do that. All right, that's one way of doing it. Okay. But I could also do it like this. I could say transform dot position plus equals, plus equals to a new vector to object where I take this information here, right? Right. I already have this transform dot position. I can just take it and put it inside uh, these values as well. So there's other ways of doing it is what I'm showing you. For now though, to make it simple, I'm just gonna take this line and copy it like this. But I'm just showing you that you could do it different ways. So I'm gonna change this to a new horizontal position. New horizontal position is instead of transform dot y is transform dot x. I'm gonna add in my new, my vertical, my horizontal position, that's what I'm doing here, horizontal, horizontal speed, right? Because that's the horizontal speed that I'm, that I'm, uh, I'm creating by, uh, in my reset. That's what it's going to be. And instead of new vertical, my new X position here, I'm just going to take the horizontal speed, or new horizontal position, and put it in there. So I got horizontal and vertical now. So this, this new vertical position, changes my up and down movement, new horizontal position does left and right movement, and now I have both, and that's the difference between my cloud and my island so far, with a bunch of other little changes that I made. Okay, let's see what it looks like on the inspector. So now if you notice on the inspector, it was actually there before when I went here, I have vertical position and horizontal position that I can put in here. That's new, right? That's new. And I did this to show you that you can mess with the inspector to make it look a little nicer, right? So give you more options. Notice the min max. I'm using min max over and over again. This is a great use of a struct, a better use of a struct, let's say. So, okay, I got to fix this up again. So when I created this, because I redid it, my values that I had in here disappeared. So I know my horizontal speed is going to go from 5 to 10. That was what it was, right? And my vertical speed is going to go, and this is, you have to think about this, minus 2, so drift to the left, to a maximum of 2. Slight drift. I'm only looking for a slight drift to the right or left. Now, maybe this isn't fast enough, right? Maybe I have to make it minus five and five. I don't know, right? But I'm going to check it out here. When I, when I save it, 
and I run it. So let's run this thing and see what happens. Whoa. That was really fast. And wow, I have a long time for seeing my cloud. What happened? <coughs> what did I do? Yeah. Hmm. Did I? I did. I did. I did. That's an easy, but it's easy to fix, right? Because you just have to go in here and say vertical speed five and ten. Thank you for your paying attention. Um, and minus two and two, right? Yay. Okay. And let's try that again. That was good. That was a good change. So, okay, that's that's a little better. So you see that I'm moving to the left a little bit. I'm moving a little bit to the right, drifting to the left, right? Still left movement, straight on, drifting to the right. You can see that there's a bit of drift now in both directions. And that's the kind of variation that I wanted for my cloud because it was not, it was just too boring, right? For it to come straight at me. All right. So I've got my cloud, guys and girl, right? This is a great space to save my code and do another commit. I've added a new feature to my, to my, uh, uh, to my code, right? Now, after this, I want to make it so that the, there's many clouds. And we're going to talk about that in a second. But let's first stop this. I'm going to save my project, save my scene, save my project, right? I want to build it to test it, build and run, right? And then after I build and run, this is a great opportunity for me to save my feature and on GitHub. Remember, we talked about this. I always want to kind of put it up on GitHub so that way if anything goes wrong, and by the way, Unity projects often go wrong or even any kind of code, I can always go back and see what the heck I did, right? What did I do to mess it up, right? Because sometimes it just is, it's messed up. Now, this building process is, actually takes longer and it actually is fatter than the actual build folder. In my build folder, I'm actually going to put up on GitHub eventually. I want to create a GitHub page, right? I want to put up a GitHub page and I'm going to show you how to do that so that when my build folder is working, right, I can put it inside my page. And it, actually, there's a, there's a bit of a a tutorial up on GitHub on how to create your own page. Now, this is something for your team. All you need is one of this. So you can you can actually host your game on GitHub. Let's try it out and see if that works. If it doesn't, there's other options. Okay, so it's building the native binaries. But to be honest with you, like just putting it out there, failure that I had uh, with my machine this week, I talked about my Mac kind of dying. Um, I had to upgrade to the latest version of, of, of Mac OS High Sierra, and that messed up my other programs too. Blender, it messed up uh, Microsoft Office, it messed up, messed up all, all kinds of stuff. And I'm pretty sure it messed up Unity too, right? That's why Mono, uh, Mono Develop didn't work earlier. I'm pretty sure that's what the reason was. Now, luckily, we were saved with Visual Studio. But if not, I would have had to try and use something else. So... All right, so now we're compiling .asm.js, right, which is the assembly module for JavaScript. It's the JavaScript assembly, so I can kind of uh, make my game that's so it's JavaScript compliant. So this is happening, and I, I should see a much more performant game when I do my WebGL build, right? Remember that your games that you're going to hand in to me all be WebGL build. I don't want to see a PC Mac build, right? It's WebGL. Right, so that's the platform. Think about WebGL as the platform that we're we're targeting in this particular case, a web game almost. Right, it's not really a web game because we're using the same thing that you can do on a PC. It's just one way of sharing our game with other people. All right, cool. So I'm done. Here's my build, and if everything goes well, you're going to see the Unity sign come up, and now you can see that this I've got my cloud working, and it's going in different directions. I got way better performance here than in my simulator right? Because it's running on the web, right? And I can see that my little game is working rather nice. Good. So I've got everything good. I've tested it with my WebGL build. This is a fantastic time to put it up on GitHub. And remember that my GitHub folder is going to be uh, down here, MailPilot demo. I want to kind of go in there, right? And I, get, I need to stop Unity for me to do my GitHub stuff. So I'm going to go to File or Unity. I'm going to quit Unity. I need to quit Unity because I don't have to quit this, but I have to quit Unity because whenever I do my the stuff with um, um, that we're, we're testing with, right? What I want to do is I want to capture some of the metadata, right? 
some of the metadata that I have. And this is the, the actual uh, folder that I want to use. So I'm going to go into my, my command prompt or terminal if you're on the Mac. Here it is. I'm going to press CD space and I'm going to grab this file, this folder, and put it in here. This works on the, on the Windows machines as well. Right. And notice that it has this for me because I'm using iTerm, right, on the Mac. It shows me that my master's not clean. The star means, hey, you got some changes. Um, you could also do a git status, right? That's the command that'll work. You can see there's all these changes that I've made <laughs> to Unity that are all changes that haven't been um, kind of up to date. So my, my Unity project is not clean right now, my, my, my GitHub project. And what I need to do is make a commit. I need, to, I need to git add dot, which adds everything that I just did to the staging area. Think about the staging area as a preliminary space, a temporary space. That I'm, I'm telling, uh, I'm, I'm saying, hey GitHub, I'm going to put all these files or get here's all these files that I'm going to I'm going to make a snapshot of my folders. I only want these files. Now I'm specifying all files with a dot, okay? But you can specify specific files for your particular commit. So I'm saying git add dot, which adds everything that I have to my pro to my uh, um, my staging area, and then I'm going to add a commit message: git commit minus m, and I'm going to call this added cloud. Uh, game object. Okay, so that's my commit. I've made these. It, it kind of uh, links the commit message to all my changes. And then after I do that, I'm going to push it to GitHub. Git push origin master. And if everything goes well, it should push my um, all my changes to GitHub. And when it does this, yeah, it's pretty big. Uh, when it does this, um, if I go up on on GitHub now, and if I go to MailPilot demo, you can see that I've got six commits, and you can see a history of how I built the project up. I started off by adding the player, I added player movement, I added the ocean, now I added the the, the island, and then last, that was last week, and then today I've added the cloud. Right, so there's my cloud. Right, so you can see the the history of my of my development, and that's what we do with GitHub. We, we kind of track our history, right? Now, you guys should be doing this with all your projects, all your software projects, even if you're not doing game development, right? Because, like I said before, it's great for, for your portfolio. You can actually, you know, when you go to an interview, you can say, hey, here's my stuff. This is how I worked with GitHub. You know, it's good to show version control best practices and all those kind of things, right? At the bare minimum. All right, cool. So we've got this up on GitHub now. I'm pretty good. I want to continue um, a little bit more. We're sitting at 9.24, we've gone almost about an hour. I want to go a little bit longer and then just talk about some problems that we're going to have now. All right, so let's talk about the new problems we're going to have. So here's my Unity project. I'm going to pull up uh, this one. And one thing I want to note about this is we've got some issues, OK? Now, here's something that I could do. I can make my cloud, first of all, my, from a prefabs perspective, I have none. Prefabs, I want you to think about them as prefabricated objects, right? I haven't made any yet for this, because I'm not really done making all my objects. There's still things that are missing from them. For example, I have no way of detecting collisions. I could detect collisions without using Unity's built-in colliders. I could do that. That's one option. And I'm going to start with that. So I'm not going to make colliders with Unity. I'm going to use other means. I'm going to use mathematics to do it a little bit, right? Just to show you math. There's ways of doing it with math, no collisions, no colliders, OK? But let's suppose I want to, I want to track my clouds. I want to have more than one cloud. Here, I need to make this a prefab. I want to create instances of the cloud object, right? Just like we do instances of objects in C Sharp. That's the idea. So I'm going to take my cloud and I'm going to pull it into my prefabs folder. When I do this, I get this little, uh, that's next to the cloud. And my cloud object in the hierarchy turns blue. You can't see it because it's kind of small. But if you look at it in your, in your screen, you see an image of the cloud here in the prefabs folder. And I'm on here in my hierarchy, you can see that the cloud object turned blue. This indicates that it's a prefab. Well, now I can actually pull in a couple of clouds, right? Let's pull in some more clouds. Now I got three clouds, cloud, cloud one, and cloud two, right? 
Now, this is the stupidest way to do it. I don't recommend this, but I want to show you this is one way of doing this. What I really want to do, though, because this is inefficient, is I want to create a pool of clouds or an array of clouds. Okay? Because it's just cloud objects, right? And I want to create an array of an object array, a game object array. Okay? Or if you think about it, instead of an array, which doesn't make any sense, I want to create a game object list. A list of game objects. Okay. So how did this work just like this, though? Does it even work? So, uh -huh. whoa. Okay, this is what I was talking about. So imagine I'm, I'm trying to avoid the clouds. I just died. Okay, so uh, I'm okay. Uh, okay, I'm okay still. I didn't die yet. I'm okay. Just want to show you. Now I'm in trouble, right? I have to really skim through the clouds. It's really angry storm clouds. Oh, I'm dead for sure. I died there, right? I haven't done collisions, but you can see that as I kind of run over these things, even as it's, as it's bumping and slowing down and speeding up, just because of I'm recording, you can see that there's going to be times where I'm going to get myself in trouble, like right there, I'm dead, right? And uh, I'm probably going to be dead here because in real time, this would be really hard to play, okay? Now, this is how it should be. This is the, the game I wanted to make. I wanted to make a cloud game where the clouds are going to stream off in different... Now, the reason why, by the way, it's speeding up again is because I'm not controlling it. Right? I'm not giving it any input, and some, somehow it's going to move. But if I want to start moving it around, you can see that it's trying to calculate, and it's messing with my, uh, my controls, right? All right, so, but if you let it go, if you see how it goes, it goes pretty quick. And if you see what's happening again in the scene, this is really interesting to look at, right, just to see it. So here's my scrolling background again, and this is the completed picture of you seeing how it goes. So the clouds keep popping in and out, randomly positioning themselves in one place to the other, randomly moving from one place to the other, right? moving off screen at different, at different speeds, right? My island is randomly positioning itself. But what I'm doing here to save myself cycles, computational power, is I'm just reusing my objects. That's what I'm doing here. I'm reusing my objects over and over again, OK? Now, you might say, hey, this is great. This is exactly what you wanted. But what if I want to have 10 clouds? What if I want to have 20 clouds? What if I want to make my clouds different sizes? What if I want to do what if, what if, what if? So this limits me a little bit, and I don't like being limited. And and forget clouds. What if you're making you're not making a male, male pilot game? You're going to make a game with aliens, right? And the aliens are going to be small enough that three clouds or three enemies not going to be enough. And maybe they're going to have their own traits. Some of the some of the enemies are going to be able to fire bullets. Other enemies are going to be like this. This might be a bit a bit of a headache in terms of managing. And the hierarchy is going to be all messed up. Like there's going to be a lot of stuff in here. Um, that's going to be, that has to be up here, just like this cloud, cloud one. What if I re want to refer to a specific cloud? It's hard to kind of, you know, indicate that this is cloud one. I could rename these cloud, cloud one, and cloud two, but that's kind of really ugly, and it's really hard coding it, and I don't want to do that, because then I have to hard code in my code. I got to I got to say, I got to indicate cloud one, cloud two, cloud three. That's no good. I want to say the first cloud, the second cloud, and the third cloud, and I want to, I want to loop through all the clouds in my list, all the aliens, uh, for example, that I'm fighting, right? If I'm fighting aliens instead of clouds. There's other issues too, too here. One of the problems that people have is they take this cloud code that I'm, I'm using it and they use it for their aliens. Why is this bad to use for their aliens? Why is this cloud code not good for their for alien ships? Anyone see that? Come on, guys, take a look. I'm going to start asking people. Okay, here we go. No one's answering me, so we're going to go to... Vincent, Vincent, tell me why is this? Why are the clouds not good? The cloud code that I just made not good for alien ships. Ask Vincent. Uh, you could, you had your chance, man. Come on, you had your chance. That's the truth, though. Yeah, sorry, he answered for you. The answer is, I know, Vincent. I'm sorry. Um, the answer is the overlap, and the overlap, overlapping ships, maybe in space in an old Space Invader game, makes sense. Overlapping ships when you're playing some other thing or overlapping cars, if this is a car game or something, makes no sense, right? So um, you may want to make something called a grid, right? A grid where the aliens can never overlap like this. They have to kind of swim. They have their own swim lanes almost. Like they kind of they go in their own swim lanes, their own patterns, and they never overlap. And if they do, they bump into each other maybe. Uh, because it's unrealistic for aliens or cars or whatever that's coming at you to kind of overlap typically, unless they have different levels. So you can show them that they're higher up somehow in 2D or 
closer to the ground. They're smaller or, or bigger, so that, to give you the, the the illusion of of depth, right? But in this particular case, um, clouds are okay because clouds can overlap, right? So that's what that makes it easy for my game, right? But alien ships cannot overlap, right? Tanks, if you had tanks coming down at you, that can't overlap either. The tanks don't overlap. If you had a bunch of tanks coming at you firing bullets and they're all coming at you in different places, tanks cannot overlap, okay? So this is a problem with the code, right? I'm not going to fix that problem. That's for you to fix because my clouds work okay for my demo. But this problem I must fix, this idea of cloud, cloud one, cloud two, that's crappy, right? So let's get rid of the clouds. And let's think about how I'm going to, I'm just going to, I'm just going to delete them, right? So there's no clouds on the scene, but I do have my cloud prefab. My cloud prefab allows me to pull a cloud into this, into the hierarchy anytime I want. But what I'd rather have is this. I want to instantiate new cloud objects somehow. And remember how scripting works in Unity. Scripting works that I must have a game object that the script is attached to. So let's think about this now. I have a couple of things that I, that I have. So I can't attach my script, this, this idea of multiple clouds, to my clouds objects because my cloud objects don't exist initially in my scene. If it doesn't exist in your scene, like this, guys, it's really important. If you're going to miss this, you're not going to understand Unity, right? Take a look. If I don't have it in my scene, there's no script that exists. My script does not exist in my game if it's not part of my scene. Okay? That's one thing to note. So I can't use the cloud object to instantiate itself. I can't do that right now. Right? I need something else. Can I put it on the ocean? Maybe. That doesn't make any sense that the ocean spawns clouds. Right? I mean, maybe it does from a real-world perspective because of the heat of the ocean or something. But not really. I want to use another object that's independent of my other game objects. Right? And I'm going to call this object, first of all, it's going to be an empty object. This is where we use empty objects. So here's my game object. It's an empty object. Notice that there's only one uh, component. It's the transform component. And I'm going to call this object the game controller. Now, this is a standard name that we use in Unity. And if you look at the tags, there's something called tags in Unity. And you can tag the game controller as of type game controller. Right? So kind of indicating that this is a game controller if I ever want to find it. Also, similarly, notice that the player, if I go back to the player, I can also tag the player as a player, right? It's actually built in. These are built in tags and you can make your own tags too. And we'll do that later. But for now, you can notice that the game controller itself, here's my game controller, is an empty object that's part of my scene, okay? It has location, rotation, and scale, but it doesn't matter. And in fact, what you should do up here is you should change with the little gear icon, right? You should change this to reset. And what this does is it zeroes out the game controller in your game because you don't care where it appears. It's not an, it's not a visible component. This is not a visual representation of any component in your game. It's just a game object that's going to contain scripts that are going to be controlling my game. Okay, that's all it's going to be. Like the ability for me to spawn more clouds, right? It's going to be controlled by the game controller. In your games, you need a game controller. Okay, I'm telling you right now, so that you can control your the way your flow is. Now, there's different ways of doing it, but I recommend it. Okay. All right, so cool. I have my game controller. And what I want to do with my game controller is I want to add some script to launch my clouds, to instantiate three clouds every time uh, my game controller comes up, right? So how do I do that? Well, I need another script. So my game controller is on a script. I'm going to go to my scripts folder. Here it is. I'm make a new script, create a new C sharp script, and I can call it the same thing: game controller. Game controller script is not the game controller object, right? It's something else. And if I go to my game controller, I can add this script in, so I can connect it. Here's my connecting. I connect it to my game controller. Right now, it's empty. If I double click my game controller script, I get the standard script which is my start and update, right? So what I want to say is something like this. I want to make a reference to my prefabs, right? I want to instantiate an object of type cloud, right? So let's do that first. How do I use my game controller to instantiate a prefab? A prefab's not in my scene, right? Hmm. Can I? 
let's try it. So in my start method, all I want to do is use the word instantiate. Okay, and if you notice, it says object, the vertical position, and any kind of rotation. Okay, that's what I want to do here. Those, that's one of them. Now there's ten different um, constructor signatures, right? That's one. The other one is I can talk about the transform parent. I can just instantiate an object, right, by itself. I may want to try and do that one, right? Okay, other options. You can see that there's different ones. Instantiate in world space, specific place. Of instantiate template. We haven't talked about templates. You probably, unless you've taken uh, programming three, anyone take programming three yet? You probably didn't, right? That's probably going to come up. Or are you taking it this semester? So you're going to be talking about generics and templates. Templates is the type of um, a class template that you're creating. Notice it says public, static, and then T for type, and then instantiate a type. You can also uh, continue the template with different options. Or you can just instantiate this other object here, number two. So what I want is just the object name itself, and I want the cloud. So will it find cloud? Right. Cloud controller, right? Here's my cloud controller, right? But that's weird. I want a new, I want my object cloud to be instantiated. So again, going back to the Unity thing, I want to say instantiate prefab, right? In Unity, right? By name. Well, let's take a look at it. Here. So, how does this work? Uh, instantiate a prefab at runtime. That's what it says. And here's a way of doing that, right? I want to say that I'm adding components here uh, in JavaScript. Here's my C sharp version, right? I'm adding components to create a primitive, right? I'm creating a primitive cube. But what I want to do is I want to instantiate an actual object. Here's my brick right and i want to instantiate the brick in a particular position okay so i need to get a reference somehow to the prefab before i instantiate it that's what i'm that's what this is basically saying okay so how do i do that huh no no it's not i like your thinking but no um so what you do is you create this cloud i'm going to make go up here and inside here's my fields again and if you notice, what I want to do is I want to use a public. I'll use public this time instead of serialized. I'm going to use public, and I want to make it so that it is a game object. It's my game object. And I want to talk about this as cloud. Notice that that goes away. But what the heck? Where do I get this public game object cloud? Now, remember, when I make it public, on the inspector, it gives me a little space. But we've never used game objects as something that goes on the inspector before. We've used floating point values, right? So how does that work? Inspector, it looks like, if I look at my game object, my game controller now, I have this little space that says none, game object. Take a look. So it's expecting some kind of game object here. Well, guess what I can do? I can go to my prefabs. And I can take my cloud and drag and drop like this. And now I have a reference for my prefab. That's as simple as it gets. Do you guys see that? So I'm, I'm taking my cloud prefab and dragging and dropping it into this little space that I've created. Right? And when I do that, if you see that this now represents a reference, this is a reference type because it's a game object. It represents my, my prefab, and I can instantiate my cloud. So this way, it allow me to instantiate one cloud. One more time. I've written a field, a public field called game object, of type game object. It gives me a little space in my inspector like this. Okay, if I wipe this, by the way, if I wipe this out, it looks like this initially, like this, right? And then I can drag and drop my cloud prefab into that little space. Right? And then I have a reference to my prefab. Right? Now, there's other ways of doing it with code. I can use my code to look at my prefabs folder and all that stuff. This is the easiest way. Okay? And if I go play now, if I'm right, it should just instantiate my cloud in its random position. Now, look what it says here in my hierarchy in runtime. 
Do you guys see that? That means it's cloned the cloud. Whenever I see clone next to an object, it means I've instantiated it at runtime, right? I haven't put it into my hierarchy. And in fact, if I stop my, my, my game, you can see that it does not, there's no cloud physically in my hierarchy at, at uh, um, design time, right? When I click this button at runtime, it adds my cloud because I made a reference to it. It adds my cloud object, right? By looking at the, this prefab, making a reference to the prefab, adds my cloud object um, into my scene or spawns my, my cloud object. That's what it's doing. Now, I haven't told it where to go, and I don't need to because the cloud object takes care of that for me. It tells me where to reset and all that stuff. It's already built into the cloud object. Just like when I dragged and dropped my cloud object into my hierarchy before, yes. So when you dragged it from prefabs folder. Prefab, then it brought all the right. Oh, and not, so that's a very good question. So the question was, I'm just recording this too. When I dragged it from the hierarchy to the prefabs folder, which is a special folder in Unity, right? Unity looks for the prefabs folder. It became a prefab. It turned it in, it turned it from just a regular game object in a hierarchy to a special type of game object called a prefab. Right? And that game object is one that I can instantiate or I can create instances of, right? New instances, copies, clones, right? But I need to do that with some kind of with some kind of code, right? Typically. Or I can drag and drop as many of these as I want into the I can mix them. For example, my game controller is putting one in, and if I want to, I can put another one in, like this. And if I did that, they, it works both ways. I can do both. Now there'll be two clouds, right? But I want to control my clouds. So let me just delete that one. I want to control my clouds with my cloud, my, my game, uh, game controller. So here's my game controller. I don't want to just instantiate a cloud. All right. I want to create, I want to create an object, a, a bunch of clouds, right? I want, you, I want to create a bunch of clouds. I want to instantiate them. And I want to keep track of them in a list, right? Yes. Yes, you could, but you don't want multiple islands in this case. One island is enough. And otherwise, the game would be too easy. I'll get too many points, right? I want to die easy and, and make it hard for me to collect points. Right now, there's no points. So more, after the break, we're going to get back. I'm going to create a user interface, and I'm going to create some collisions and all that stuff. Right? I'm going to talk about collision detection, right? And I'm going to do it raw with math, right? And we're going to talk about positives and negatives about it. The positive and negatives about doing it, and without using any colliders. Because some of you have been taught how to use colliders in Unity. And colliders are great, but I want to I want to talk about stuff like raw code. How do I do it without colliders? All right, but we want to fix this problem. And I want to create this list. I want to create a list of, of clouds that I want to keep track of with my game controller. I want to know which cloud got hit, right? Because maybe I want to reset that cloud. I want to, you know, or maybe a cloud has different sizes. I want to keep track of something different for each cloud relative to everyone else. Because maybe I want to change the scale of a cloud with my game controller or something else. Maybe change the, the, the sprites that goes along with the cloud. I don't know, right? But I want to be able to track my clouds individually. For your, in your case, think about them as maybe a bunch of aliens, right? And they're different kinds of aliens. All right, so how do I do this? So here's my public field. This is outside, right? And this is on the inspector. But I also want to create a, 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 a list of type cloud. And how do I do that? Well, first of all, notice that we have systems collections built in, right? So using systems, systems collections is C Sharp's way of keeping track of or creating lists. So recall how we do lists in C Sharp. I want to make it, first of all, a private list. So I don't care about sharing this thing. Now it's going to be a, a type list. So private, I name the type list, right? And it's going to be of type something, right? What type will it be? Will it be? Can I do cloud? Cloud's an object. If I say cloud, a list of type cloud, it doesn't work. It's a cloud controller. How about game object? Game object I can do. So it's a list of game objects, right? And I'm going to call them clouds, lowercase. And you can also make it with an underscore because we know this is only something that's going to be internal to our game. So list of type clouds. Okay, the list by, def by, by default, this list of type clouds 
is not populated or even instantiated. This is an object. I'm not, I'm not, right now, the list, when we make a, a list, what happens? Is there anything inside the list when we create it? No. We have to populate the list, right? So we have a couple of things to do. One, inside my start method, I'm going to, this is where I do all my, my instantiation and my initialization, right? In my start method. Uh, in my list, right, I want to define my list. So I'm going to say something like this. I'm going to say clouds, this, that underscore clouds, is equal to a new list of type game object, right? That's what I want, type game object. Okay, so it's a game object list. Yay, I've got a game object list. It's an empty container. And then instead of just doing instantiate cloud, what I want to do is I want to create, I want to populate my list with a number of clouds. So, but what if I want to test one cloud, two clouds, three clouds, four clouds, five clouds, 10 clouds, what, and forget, forget it's a cloud, it's an alien. It's, a, it's, a, it's something that you're going you're gonna to overcome right now, not a, an obstacle. Call it what you, what you want, right? So I want, to, I want to give the user or the, the person who, like me, I want to give myself a chance to put, instead of hard coding the number of clouds, I want to give myself a chance to put some in there. So I'm going to say public. We'll use public for now. And I want to use float, and we'll call it cloud number. Right, cloud number. All right, so public float cloud number. Yes, sorry. Let's make an integer. Thank you for that. I might be, float can work too, but it's fine. Then what I want to do is I want to make a for loop, right? My for loop is going to start off. Um, we're going to we're going to use instead of i. I don't never like to use i, right? We're going to call this the cloud index or whatever you want to call it, right? Um, it doesn't really matter. More like a count, right? That's what it is. Where my count is lot less than this cloud number, whatever the cloud number is that I decide on, right? And every I'm going to loop three times or ten times or whatever I put into the, the cloud number, right? And I want to instantiate a new cloud every time, right? But I want to store them inside my list. So I want to do two things: instantiate my cloud and store it in my list. So I can do that by saying that var. Well, actually, let's go back. So I can say this that underscore clouds is equal to. I'm going to take this object here and just let's see if this works, right? I'm going to copy this up here and put it over here. Can I do this? It's almost like I want to make a new cloud object, right? That's what I want to do, right? And it says that, well, I can't do this because my cloud is a, is a, a list. So I have to kind of put add, right? I want to put an, an add, and I want to take my instantiate statement, this instantiate, and I want to get gets rid of this, this part right here. I want to take this part. I want to cut it out and put it inside here, right? Now, can I do this? So I want to add a cloud to the list. Does this make sense? That because my instantiate itself, what it does is it returns a game object, right? And because it returns a game object, which is a reference type, I when I use my add method, which is built into all lists, right? It expects a game object because the list is a type of game object. So I'm actually loading it with a game object that is being instantiated when the, with the instantiate statement. That's what's happening. Okay. So if I did this correctly, right? This is creating a pool of clouds, cloud pool. Guys and girl, this is the best way to do bullets, right? Because I can keep track of a certain number of bullets, a certain number of clouds, right? For example, I may not want to continue to instantiate forever bullets. I want to instantiate, let's say, 50 bullets and put them inside of, a, inside of a, a, um, an array or a list and then reuse the bullets over and over again. Because instantiation, right? takes computational cycles whenever I do an instantiation, especially in game. I remember I'm doing this. If I instantiate every time I reset, remember I'm resetting stuff right now, right? I'm resetting my clouds. I'm resetting my object, my, my background. I'm resetting everything. And I'm doing that because I don't want to instantiate. I could create new objects every time, but I don't want to do that, right? I want to reuse objects. 
And this is one way of doing it. I create a cloud pool or a cloud list. Okay, so this is my cloud pool. If it works like I think it's going to work, maybe I'm wrong. What it's going to do is it's going to create up to three clouds or however many I want. So, so far I haven't named how many and it's going to error out because this dot cloud number has not been defined. Let's define that number. So I'm going to go to my game controller and you see that the cloud number appears here. I want to put in one for now. Uh, I want to test all numbers. I want to start one cloud number one. Okay. Notice my for loop starts at zero. So it should produce at least one cloud. Let's see if that works. So run. And if I'm good, then there's one cloud. Yay. Here's the great thing. This allows me to try different clouds. Maybe one is too small and I want to try two, right? Let's try two clouds. As how does this work? Yay. There's two clouds. And this is way more control and way better than dragging and dropping stuff from the, from the, the prefabs into the hierarchy. Okay. Let's try three clouds, right? So let's try that out. Yay. Three clouds. That's kind of hard, right? Now you can think about how to make levels, right? If it's level one, add one cloud. If it's level two, add two clouds. If it's level three, I mean, I'm increasing the number of enemies, right? And if I want to, right, when I instantiate, I can do some funky things to them. Now I probably wouldn't do that. I probably would. I probably would want to bundle all my randomization into the cloud object to keep it simple, right? Like, for example, every time I, I spawned a cloud, if I want to change the scale, I wouldn't put it in my game controller typically. I'd want to put it in my cloud object because then every cloud object would have that randomization, like the random range that I created and the random speed and all that kind of stuff, right? So this is cool. So I've created a cloud prefab and a game controller with some randomization. Now, I have, the great thing is, I have a public game object, right? A public game object that I can make. Now I've made it private, this list of clouds. I made it private so far, right? But I could make this public, right? And if I do, I have access to the, the cloud list. Let me show you how this works. Let's change my private list of game objects that we call clouds, right? To a public list of, of game object called clouds. I did this on purpose to show you the difference. So here's my public list. I'm making it from pub private to public. Let's rename this so that it appears nicely. So I'm just going to rename this thing. So I'm refactor rename. We'll call it clouds, right? So it works in my code. And then let's see what happens over here. Clouds. What I get is actually a size of num a number of clouds that I have here, a size of the number of clouds. Now there's two ways to do this. I can load my list in two ways. Here's one way, this, right? A list of game objects. Or I can drag and drop clouds in here like this. I want to drag and drop the, the cloud inside my cloud list, right? Lotus House is plus. And I can keep doing that and keep doing that to produce as many clouds as I want. Why is this good? Right now, it's a list of clouds. By the way, my code is going to override this list uh, when my code actually create a new list but I can do it here this way as well why is this good and we do this in unity as well sometimes because what if it's not a cloud list but an enemy list right my enemy list so it could be a mix of clouds as long as it's a game object it's okay a mix of clouds planes other kinds of enemies that come at me and I can keep track of all of them in the list right Gives me more variation here. And I don't have to make references to the cloud the same way I did it, right? See how I have my cloud up there? I can get rid of that if I really want to. I don't care about that anymore, right? All I care about is that I got a list of game objects called enemies, and I can keep track of them. So we're not going to go there yet, but I wanted to show you that this is something that I can do. I can track the clouds publicly, right? And the reason why I also want to do this is what if different enemies give you different score? object called scoreboard that keeps track of the number of, of, of every time it gets hit scoreboard would be another game object that's empty which we're going to create that's going to keep track of scoring and showing my user interface right and it keeps track of which enemy is being hit right as opposed to just clouds right 
So I'm just showing you options here. There's lots of options in Unity, and this is one of them that I think is was really, really good. Now, if I don't want to do this, again, I can just, I can do these two things. I can zero this out, right? So if I zero it out, it goes away. So this is kind of cool, right? Um, and I don't even have to use this. I can just leave it blank like this. But at runtime, this is neat, right? If I show it here at runtime, you'll see I can expand it at runtime to see what happens. So let's just try this out. So I'm going to run it. And at runtime, you can see that it's been it's full of clones. And I can see the type of cloud. This is really a neat thing because I can see the cloud objects that have been loaded into my list dynamically at runtime. Right? These are them right here, these three. Right? Does that make sense? Real control. It gives me real control and a visibility of my cloud objects, right? Where I wouldn't have this normally. All right, so we're going to stop recording now. I'm going to take a short break. I'm going to put this up on GitHub and all that stuff. But let's do a couple of things. So my first step, because I've got, I've made my, my, my game controller for the first time, is I'm going to save my scene. I'm going to save my project, right? I'm going to build and run. So I'm going to test out my new, my new features, right? And once I've tested out my, my, my new features, once I know that this works, remember, even though it works in the simulator, you don't know if it works on your platform of choice. For example, if you made it for the PS4 or PC or Mac or whatever, you need to test it. Because just like we do when we do mobile application development, if I make a, a, mobile, a mobile app for my phone and it looks great in the simulator, I don't know if it really works until I test it on my phone. right? So it's like I'm doing this with my WebGL build. I'm taking a look at it and going, hey, is this working? Can I confirm that it's working? Right? And I want you guys to do this because if you hand in something, example, you hand in your code, you're like, um, let's say, for example, Vincent is working on his code with his buddies, right? his, his friends over there in the corner. right? And it works great in the simulator. But when you hand it in, it doesn't build in the WebGL build. That's bad. That means like your target platform is not working. Uh, in real life, that would be a failure. right? It's not good. right? So you must check it when it comes to, does it work on your platform? And what if you have multiple platforms? For example, Right now, we're only checking only one platform. We're only doing WebGL. But what if your, your game is supposed to work on WebGL, PC, and Mac? Maybe it's going to be on, ported on to an iOS device or Android device. I mean, because you know, Unity has the ability for you to write once and port everywhere. That's one of the beautiful things about Unity, right? It'll actually convert your code to uh, an app, um, an iOS app, an Android app, um, um, you know, let's say a, PS, a PS4 app, a PS Vita app. It'll do it all, right? But you have to test it in every platform. All right. It looks pretty good. We've got three clouds, right? It's pretty good from a speed perspective, right? I'm running my uh, my thing pretty good. You can see that all the um, all the clouds are random, right? And it's taken my code nicely. So this is a great place to stop and take a break. And what I'm going to do first is I'm going to stop Unity. So I'm going to just quit Unity. Right, and just like I did before, I'm going to go into my command line. So I'm going to clear my command line. You can see again that my I got changes. I'm going to say git add dot. I recommend for people who can't remember the git commands, make a little batch file, make a little uh, little take a little notepad or um, or some kind of uh, you know text file. Make a text file that has all your commands in in order, so you don't have to remember them all the time. Right. So git add dot commit minus M in the message, right? For example, we added a game controller, right? That's what we did, game controller. There we go. And we, uh, we're going to push it to the repo, right, to the GitHub. Now, you can see that my, my, my project continues to grow. Right now, it's 58 megs. That's pretty big, right? And the reason why this, so, this is so big is because I have some garbage files that I'm also putting up on GitHub that I'm going to get rid of eventually, right? But I wanted to show you here that this is something that happens, OK? All right, so let's take a short break. And when we come back, their interface, we have a user interface and collision detection. So those are the two things we're going to start on. First, collision detection, that's the next, the next step. And then if we can get to it by the end of the day, I'd like to finish off the game with a user interface. 
if I can get to it today, if we have time, like we're still sitting at pretty early, we're still at 10 o'clock. If I can get to it today, I'd like to even make three different scenes. A start scene, the play scene, and the end scene. And if I can get that done, then you have a template of how to make your first game. Okay. I'm also going to give you a little lab today. I want you, I'm going to, I'm going to give you um, mail pilot. And just as practice for each of you, it's going to be an individual lab. It's not going to be a team lab, right? Where I want you to take mail pilot and I want you to turn it sideways. All right. You're going to get my code, you're going to download it on its side and make a side scroller, right? Where the clouds come from the side, right? And instead of it coming from up, up uh, above you. So how do you do that, right? How's that going to be done? Um, we're going to talk about that. How do you how do you scroll from right to left? You've got an ocean that goes from up from uh, from top down. How do you fix that? That's number one. The first question. The second thing is what how do you what do you do when you have an asset that's built for up and down, right? And the next thing is, how do I make my clouds go from right to left, as opposed to up and down, right? Because your side scroller may not be a top down side scroller. It might or a top down scroller. It might be a side scroller, like I've asked you to make in your in your games, right? So let's see how that works. For now, though, let's stop recording. And when we come back, we'll talk about some of these things.